Okay, it's one o'clock. Okay, wait, one, two, three, four. Waiting for Mayor Terziano and Councillor Fitzgerald. Okay, I think everybody's here. How about that? And it's one o'clock. So I'm going to call the meeting to order and welcome everybody to the hearing today exactly at one o'clock. How cool is that? I can confirm that we do now have quorum. And today I would like to do the land acknowledgement. So I, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe under the terms of the Robinson Huron Treaty number 61 of 1850 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. We commit to acknowledge, learn, educate, create opportunity, honor sacred places, and take actions toward real truth and reconciliation in support of our commitment to walking the path together in respect, peace, and harmony for future generations. So um, with that, I do have a motion to um, adopt the agenda, moved move by Councillor Weeb, seconded by Councillor Armour. It is recommended that the Planning Committee agenda dated February 16th, 2022, be hereby adopted as printed and circulated. All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. Are there any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, we are, we are moving right along here. So today, um, at this point, I would normally read um, the preamble for a public meeting, but today we don't have any items that are part of a public meeting. So at this point, um, um, this is when I would welcome everybody again. And as there is, are no public meetings today, we will move to the non-public portion of the meeting. If you have registered to make a deputation or if the applicant or the agent wishes to make comments regarding their application, please raise your hand after the staff presentation. Before speaking, you are requested to first state your name and mailing address, and please note that presentations are limited to 10 minutes. So why I just said that was even though it's not a public meeting, for each of the, the applications before us in the non-public, the applicant or their representative representative um, are given an opportunity to speak to the application if that's what they'd like to do. And I will remind um, those representatives of that at that time. So with that, um, we will go directly to our first report and uh, Kelsey Shadlock will be speaking to report number development 2022 20 Site plan approval 127 2021 HTE Top Coat Pain Painters Inc. Over to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much. I'll just prepare my screen. Is everyone able to see that? Perfect. So thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, the subject property is located at 50 Menominee Street. The lot is designated residential in the urban settlement area and is zoned residential four. The applicant is seeking approval for a site plan agreement to permit the construction of a three story, 26 unit multi dwelling residential building. Within the official plan, the urban residential designation generally encourages intensification throughout the built up area. The plan also identifies a number of sorry, intensification policies, such as promoting a range of housing choices, increasing densities, and achieving an appropriate transition of built form to adjacent areas. In this instance, the proposed apartment building conforms with the 60 unit per gross hectare maximum outlined in the a lot in density requirements contained in the LP for highest density residential development. The proposed development is also permitted within the residential four zone. Design criteria uh, contained in the official plan um, ensures that new residential development proposed in the residential designation will contribute to a community well-being and compatibility. 
The criteria encourages retention of vegetation augmented with high a high degree of naturalized landscaping and the provision of trails to connect new residential development with the surrounding community. The site plan shows the required landscape buffers are proposed along the property lines. However, to better address the, this criteria, a landscaping plan is recommended um, to detail the vegetation proposed for removal, retention, uh, along with the appropriate tree preservation measures. The plan will also be required to specify the quantity of trees, shrubs, and other vegetation to be planted in addition with the species and the size. Uh, the provided traffic in back brief examine the pedestrian connectivity uh, and the town of Huntsville draft sidewalk master plan. There is no sidewalk on the south side of Menominee Street and the sidewalk master plan does not further identify Menominee Street. The author of the report, however, examined the opportunity to provide a pedestrian connection between Menominee Street and Cliff Avenue. In the review, they determined an additional assessment would be required to formalize this connection given the elevation differential and to meet OADA, AODA requirements. Investigation of this connection should be further reviewed by the applicant with the town's operation and protective services staff. The traffic impact study also assessed the road capacity and transportation impacts. The brief um, concluded that the existing road infrastructure has appropriate capacity to accommodate this development and no um, road improvements were recommended. Constraint mapping identifies sleep slope areas on the property. The applicant included a geotechnical investigation with the provided functional servicing report. Uh, siltation and erosion measures were recommended in the report, such as heavy silt fencing uh, and construction vehicles using stone mud mats and regular inspection of control measures. These recommendations address the sloping uh, and will be implemented through site plan control. However, staff are also recommending um, retention of existing vegetation where possible to further mitigate risks to erosion and slope stability. It's also worth noting that in the report, a uh, D4 study was identified as a further requirement. However, this assessment has now been provided and will be reviewed by staff. Just based on their initial, uh, initial review by myself, the report concluded that there is a low likeliness that the landfill, the closed landfill will have an adverse effect on the proposed development. District comments were attached in attachment four to the report indicating no major concerns. Um, the town's operation department has requested uh, additional information in regards to the stormwater management infrastructure. Um, the stormwater management plan may be subject to change following receipt of this information. The town's fire department had also showed concerns about the slope of the driveway and recommended based on the sloping that the building should be sprinklered and the applicant has now included in that in their proposal. The application appears to uh, conform to the intent of the official plan and be consistent with the provincial policy statement. Therefore, um, staff, oh, sorry, and staff were recommending approval of the site plan um, subject to the conditions to address outstanding matters noted in the report, any requested revisions for re relevant review agencies, and the lots being merged on title. Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much for that, Kelsey. I, um, I will ask if the applicant or their representative, if they are here, if they did want to speak to, to this or not. The applicant or their representative are reminded to use the raise hand button to indicate that they would like to address committee. And Chair Alcock, I do see one hand raised. Okay. Please note that during the transition, your video panel will be momentarily interrupted. Once you've been added to the meeting, your video will appear in the committee member panel. Please have your microphone and video if possible turned on before you begin speaking and please confirm your name and mailing address.
Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hi, hi there. I can hear you. I can't see you. Maybe oh, we, now we can see okay, you. Okay, here we go. Hi, Welcome. my name is Matthew May. Uh, I'm a partner uh, in the Good Life Building Company. Um, uh, my partner, his name is Pablo Willis. Uh, so I think uh, I'm kind of filling in for him on this one, on this call. So uh, I do have some information. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about anything, I'd be happy to do my best and try to answer those questions. But uh, is there anything in, spe in specific that... Uh, uh, well, what, hold. Uh, that's great that you're here and we're happy and delighted to have you. Um, I will, uh, if you um, turn off your... your um, Turn on your mute. That would be great. Okay. And we'll ask you to stay because I, at this point, I will ask committee if they do have questions. And we now know that you're there to, um, and available to respond. So we appreciate it. Okay. At this point, I will ask, um, are there questions from committee? Councillor Weeb followed by Councillor Armour. Uh, thank you, Chair Alcock. Uh, really quickly, can staff re-outline or add a little more detail to the idea of the connectivity of either a sidewalk or trail can either an overhead map or uh, just flesh that out a little bit for me. Great. Kelsey. Yeah, we have to address that uh, for you, Chair Alcock to Councillor Weeb. I'll just pull up my screen um, to show where it would be. Perfect. Thank you. If that's okay. Um, So is everyone able to see that? Great, so here's the subject property and here's um, Cliff Avenue. So right now there's, um, and it was identified in the traffic brief that right now there's kind of a drainage uh, ditch that people are kind of, there's a desire line that people are clearly using to go uh, between the two streets. Um, but it was mentioned in the report that there's quite a different elevation um, between those. So to make it accessible, there would need to be further um, work done. Um, but yeah, right here, just to kind of further. So this is the building and this is kind of where the McDonald's drive through goes and that's the McDonald's and the motel. So the right now that's, that's the access that we're looking at. Um, I don't know if Matt had any further, anything further to add to that or if there are any th further questions. Matt, did you want to add to that or I can't see, or did Kelsey answer that? Yeah, I guess the only thing that I'll add to that is that um, it was suggested that uh, some sort of stairs or access or throughway uh, be provided at the end of the cul-de-sac there uh, by the, by the town. Oops, you mean the town asked for that? Is that what you're saying? Well, it was requested uh, or suggested to be uh, to be done either. I think it's in the uh, pedestrian and traffic impact study, but also I believe it was received in comments uh, from the town at some point okay. and or district for that to be done uh, on behalf of the town as well or okay. to be by the town not by the developer. All right, Kelsey, can you follow up on that, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, I, it was like there was a comment that they would like it to be a, done in conjunction with the town, uh, but I believe that they, the applicant would have to speak further with operations to decide how that would work in terms of the implementation, implementation of the pedestrian connection. Um, but yeah, that's as far as we got with that. Okay, Councillor Weeb, are you satisfied or, or do you have a follow up? I, I guess so. I guess what I'm hearing is that um, I don't know if the developer is, it sounds like they're going to foot the bill as long as the town can guide them through it. That's just how I'm reading it. But if I'm hearing it differently, then uh, uh, speak up. Is that a fair read, Matt? Uh, that was not uh, under the impression that, that we got um to be honest and uh, again i'm just kind of uh stepping in here for pablo he's he's been more uh you know in charge of that and the dealings with the town but uh, i do know from speaking with him that um that was mentioned to him 
So um, he, he, here's just maybe, and maybe because you're stepping in, often it, it is the case when we have developments that, that um, applications that come forward to us, that we do actually ask in the case of the applicant to provide where they can linkages, whether it's trails or stairs or whatever, or sidewalks or whatever, okay. um, so that um, that would be part of the development. And that's something that we traditionally do. So it wouldn't be a surprise to Councillor Weeb's comment that um, the onus would be on the, the applicant in this case. Okay. Um, I guess, I mean, that's fine. That's something that we can discuss, but I guess for me, it's, it's not on private property. It's, it's on, you know, it's not on our property, I guess. And it's at the end of a cul-de-sac and I get, you know, by us making some improvements, it's going to make it better. And obviously with the building that is going to be constructed there, there's going to need, there's going to be more pedestrians using that. And I totally understand that, but um, I get, I, I'm willing to kind of, I'd be willing to negotiate and see where it goes, but I guess I was just under the impression that uh, we weren't entirely responsible to foot the bill for something like that. But again, I, I'm more than willing to, I think both of us are, are more than willing to continue that conversation and seeing where it goes. And maybe it's like we're sharing in the cost type thing. And, and I think that can be. Okay. Right. All right. I appreciate your response. Thanks. You. So, I just have a question. Uh, is that something that will get included in the, the site plan agreement specifically? Well, it's not, can, I haven't read the, the, if you hold for one sec, I, the, I do have the motion before me and um, it currently is not conditional on that. So. Okay. But I, I should actually be letting Kelsey respond to that. Sorry. Um, I would like to go to Councillor Armour. You've had your hand up for a bit. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got just a quick question. That uh, it's a great location for sure. To um, it sort of fits in right there with Salem Heights. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if the rentals are they going to be um, affordable housing or uh, are you and then size of apartments. Matt? Yeah, so um, we're thinking uh, market rents for those apartments. They won't be uh, affordable housing, uh, but we the, the rents will be market rents. Um, in terms of the size and the unit mix, um, it is primarily one bedroom units. I believe there's 22 one bedroom units and then four two bedroom units. Okay. Um Good. Uh, any other questions? You know what? I went right into questions without reading the motion, which is not what I normally do. And I apologize to everybody. So I'm going to read the motion now. <laughs> and, and I hope everybody forgives me. But here we go. I do have a motion moved by uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, seconded by Councillor Stone, be it resolved that Director of Development Services approved site plan application SPA 127-2021 HTE and that the agreement be prepared to the satisfaction of the town and further that the mayor and clerk are hereby authorized to sign any necessary documentation conditional on one, a satisfactory D4 assessment being provided and any mitigation requirements being implemented. Two, the lots merging in title and three, all final plans and drawings being to the satisfaction of the town and all other commenting agencies. And I know, uh, Kelsey, you made reference to the fact that the D4 assessment has subsequently been submitted. So are you suggesting that we now stroke that first condition out of this motion? Thank you, Chair Alcock, for the question. Um, it can be left in just because we still have to review it. We've already gotten it and I don't, uh, we, we discussed this earlier. Um, okay. And I don't think it'll make a huge difference if it's left in because we already have it. Okay, that's great. Thank then you. It'd be a lot easier to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, are there any other questions from committee? Is that a hand up, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald? No. Councillor Weeb. Uh, thanks, Chair Alcock. Okay, so just to be clear, then that motion, the way it's the way it's read, uh, has the final clause in which says. 
uh, to the satisfaction, right, of the town. So again, that leaves me wondering where does it put the little the linkage that, while seems somewhat insignificant, is actually really kind of key uh, to have pedestrian linkage. So I, I I'm just wondering um, how we arrive, how we vote on this in order to um, ensure that we'll get a, a a decent a satisfactory result uh, in the end. In essence, if I may. Um, all final plans and drawings being to the satisfaction of the town, I guess it depends on, to your point, uh, what will satisfy the town. I think this committee is saying that having the public access built in is important. Is Kelsey, can I ask you how, how you would be dealing with that? Do we need to be specific in this to give you direction? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe it can be added in as a condition. I'll defer to Kirsten or Richard, but I believe that that's something that would have to be further discussed with operations. But if it's something that you would prefer to be further spelled out to ensure that it's addressed, I believe that's something you could do. But again, if Kirsten- I'm going to, to I'm going to, thank you for that. I'm going to defer to Kirsten, if you could. Or actually I noticed Richard just jumped in. So Richard. Yeah, if I can, and uh, if I need help from Kirsten, she can jump in. But um, through you, Madam Chair, what I would say is that's typically what the purpose of this discussion at committee is. Um, we hear uh, the feedback, um, the proponent hears the feedback. Um, and then that last clause, which um, addresses that all plans be prepared to the satisfaction of staff, we would use that clause to ensure everything is okay with the plans. It's all shown on a plans. If there's offsite works that are needed, we get a plan that shows those offsite works. Um, if there's a cost associated with offsite works, we get an estimate. Um, so yeah, once we hear feedback from you at committee, we work with the proponent to ensure those things get addressed and we use that last condition. So I don't think an additional one's needed, but that being said, it's always a possibility. If you want extra belts and suspenders, you could you could add it in. Okay, appreciate that, Councillor Weep. Uh, thank you, Chair Alcock. I guess I don't know that I'm. Uh, we necessarily have to add it in. Um, it, it it perkins back right to last month with a multi-unit around the corner where they part of the plan was to add a sidewalk along their right. you know what front fronted fronted their property. Um, I guess um, I guess I would say that uh, if if our staff can hear or, or if we can agree as a committee that we'd like to see something there, whether and they can be mutually agreed upon, whether they split the cost or what have you. As the proponent said, I'm sure they'll be willing to work with our staff. Uh, should um, a small section of either a few stairs or some linkage uh, be required, um, I'm hoping that committee would agree that it would be important. It's a small thing, but it's an important thing. I, uh, so I, I, I would I, leave my comment there, I suppose. Okay, appreciate it. I certainly agree. I think it makes all the sense in the world. We mention it almost in every application. Connectivity is critical. It's part of our um, official plan. And uh, so I, I, I think it's a great point. And um, I will go to Mayor Terziano. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I agree that the connectivity is important, but I also think that in all fairness, uh, we have a very up-to-date sidewalk master plan that did not identify this as an area where, where that was required. And to put the onus onto an applicant that wants to build there as, as a condition of their build, I think is a little bit unfair. If there's a way to work between the town and them to improve, and don't forget, there is an unofficial trail system there already. Um, so if there's if there's a way to improve that, but I don't I don't believe the onus should be put on the applicant in this case. It's not been identified as a as a future trail or sidewalk in our master plan. If they work together, that's great. But I would not be supporting it as a condition of this. I appreciate your comments. I think um, very good. I just want to confirm that what I was suggesting was not saying that they are required to build a sidewalk. To me, it was just to ensure that, that the connectivity piece was in place. And they, that could be the confirmation of an existing trail and making sure that the trail is very clear 
and um, accessible. So uh, I, I concur. I don't think we should be putting on the, the, um, the applicant to build a sidewalk if it hasn't been identified in our master plan. That would, that would be um, a bit much. So I agree with you. Um, all right. I think we've heard um, all of the comments and I am going to call the question at this point, um, unless there are other questions. None, so I will call the question. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you for being here, Matt. No problem. I do have one question. I don't know if I could sneak it in real quick. Uh, if it's, um, can it be directed to staff or do you need to ask us? Um, yes, well, you, yes, you I'll can ask your the, question. Uh, I guess jumped off there. It was just regarding tree removal at the site and when when we could actually um, uh, get that done, I suppose, because they're, the bird nest season is coming up. Uh, I believe it's the third week of March and we are up against half loads. And uh, obviously we're just in the process of getting this thing approved. And we'd like to, we'd like to, uh, you know, remove the trees at the site so that we don't have issues down the line. And we can actually develop this property this year right? Because if we don't remove those trees, uh, there's really high likeliness of not being able to put a shovel in the ground until maybe even next year or, you know, later this fall, which could, you know, it's, it's just delaying, you know, that housing from hitting the market if we don't, uh, if we're not able to do that. That's all I wanted to say. It just No, it's a, a really important question. It's something that we're really, um, it matters to us about, you know, those issues. So um, if I may ask Director Maxwell, could could you? Um, I, I would just thank you, Chair Alcock, that uh, Mr. May contact Kelsey um, and she can discuss those details with him. Perfect. Thank you. All right. You heard that, Matt? Good. All good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank All you. right. All right. I'm not uh, seeing any questions. So with that, I am going to move to our next item and it's over to Richard to deal with um, Report Development 2022-22, SPA 53-2020, HT Craig Developments. Great, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so I'm getting a note that you can see that now, so I'll start. Um, so through you, Madam Chair, the subject property is located at uh, Saprina Park Drive. The lands are zoned residential three, holding with exception 0415, and residential four holding with exception 0416. And they're designated urban residential within the Huntsville urban settlement area in the official plan. My slides are not advancing. Are they advancing on your screen? Uh, no, nope. Okay, I'm gonna try to stop sharing. Okay. One more thing. We all have, Richard, we all have it in our package though, if, if it yeah. works. Okay, um, let me try one more thing. Okay. There we go. Okay, excellent. I apologize, I'm at home and uh, I don't have three screens in front of me like I normally do in the office, so, but I'll make two. Um, the site plan application is for the construction of a multi-phase development consisting of 16 townhouses and five three-story multi-unit residential buildings containing 147 units. So 171 units overall. It should be noted that the plans show um, eight townhomes in one block along Sabrina Park Drive as being part of the development. But in actual fact, those 
um, lands were severed from this property in 2018, so they're not subject to this application. From a phasing perspective, the development will be divided into three phases. So phase one includes 16 townhouses and the ring road. Phase two would include buildings number four and building number five. Um, building four is a 26 unit building and building five is a 37 unit building. And phase three would include buildings one, two, and three, which are to contain 26 units, 32 units, and 26 units, respectively. Committee may recall that this development layout was approved in 2019 when zoning bylaw amendment Z62 2018 was approved. Committee may also recall that a holding provision was placed on the lands at that time to prevent de development from proceeding until the Director of Development Services is satisfied with adequate provisions for infrastructure, um, are either adequate provisions for infrastructure, are either they're either constructed or secured, an environmental impact assessment is satisfactorily completed, or th and the necessary development agreements have all been entered into. As was previously the case, this um, proposed development consists of a range of housing choices that appear compatible with the character of the surrounding lands on Sabrina Park Drive and the higher density not-for-profit housing to the south. This development appropriately positions the five uh, higher density three-story buildings along the outer periphery of the property. Um, and it locates the three the townhouse units along Sabrina Park, where the eight other townhomes are located. Um, so it's a good um, it's a good uh, compatible or it's compatible with the surrounding lands. Although the development will exceed the residential density targets expressed in the 2019 official plan, it's noted that the density for this development was previously approved under the provisions of the 2006 official plan. And it's also noted that it includes a component of affordable housing. Under the 2019 official plan, residential development may exceed the medium and high density targets provided there's a community, uh, where there's a community benefit provided and um, affordable housing would be such a community benefit um, subject to there being an agreement in place to provide that housing. And in this case, there is already an agreement in place um, in that regard. Respecting environmental protection policies contained in the official plan, uh, it's noted that a natural heritage evaluation was conducted in the past by Riverstone Environmental Solutions in 2012 in support of a previous development uh, for 80 townhouse units. And that was approved. According to that study, the lands contain wetlands, watercourses, steep slopes, and potential habitat for species at risk. Although the limits of development for this development are more compact than that 80 unit townhouse development, an updated environmental impact as assessment is still required as is contemplated through the holding provisions and that environmental impact assessment is still outstanding. It's noted, however, that Riverstone has confirmed that the realignment of a stream on site um, can occur without resulting in any concerns from a fish habitat perspective. Um, the updated environmental impact study would still be needed though to address the modified development proposal and to address species at risk. Site plans submitted in support of this development may require minor revisions to address that EIS and any impact avoidance or mitigation recommendations in it. Additionally, revisions will be needed to achieve consistency within engineering drawings related to site servicing and stormwater management and drainage. On review of lighting plans uh, submitted in support of this application, it does appear that there is some light trespass uh, associated with light standards um, around the ring road 
and in some parking locations. So that would be something that we would work with the applicant to address. Um, detailed landscape plans were submitted and I have a few slides to show those. Um, these plans provide appropriate um, planting details and direction. However, it's noted that minor revisions would be necessary uh, or may be appropriate to address tree preservation uh, recommendations in the final environmental impact study. There's a few um, of the elevations for the uh, higher density three-story buildings. So this is the front. These would be the sides and the rear of those buildings, and they're, each of the buildings are very similar. This is a artist's rendering of what those buildings could look like, and it did get cut off. It was the full building, um, but I apologize to the proponent. I could only find um, this one. And this is an artist's rendering of what the townhouse units could look like. Here are some of the site photos of what the property looks like today in the winter. Some shots of the surrounding uh, lands on Sabrina Park. And again, the site looking at um, a high point of land in behind it, which would remain vegetated according to the landscape plans. Um, district engineering and public works staff comments are forthcoming and the plans will require revision to address their comments. A servicing agreement must be entered into with the district prior to development proceeding and a holding provision requiring this is in place. Comments have been received from building relating to environmental compliance approval requirements for stormwater management and drainage. And it's noted that a peer review consultant was retained by the town to undertake review of the functional servicing and stormwater management report, and it was deemed appropriate following resubmission to address their comments. Great. It's also noted that an environmental compliance approval is, was submitted. No other objections have been received to date. Oops. And the application appears to conform with the official plan and be consistent with the provincial policy statement. And staff are recommending approval of the site plan application subject to conditions to address outstanding matters noted in the report and any requested revisions from relevant review agencies. And I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, I don't know if uh, Teresa is listening or here to speak to. This, but if she is, um, I would ask at this time to um, call upon her. Thank you, Chair Alcock. I do see one hand raised. Okay, perfect. Just a reminder to please have your microphone and video if possible turned on before you begin speaking and to confirm your name and mailing address. Always this delay, eh? This bit of a delay. <laughs> there she is. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, Teresa. How are we? Okay, we can hear you and we can see you. That's Says good. Mary, Mary Terry. There yeah, you go. Mary, I, I'm, it's, it's my disguise. Okay. All right. <laughs> my alter ego. <laughs> So um, do you have anything you want to add to what Richard said at this point? No, just very happy that we can finally just um, bring this to site plan. It's, uh, it's one of the things we really just need to get finished and get started. Um, we also have the subdivision and condo application being done by the district right now, and that should be registered soon. But if we, we really, really to start building the 
first eight townhouses, but if we get this done, we can start planning the next 16 townhouses and then the rental units. So okay. this was the last step. This is pretty much the last step for us to. Okay, um, if you hold on, I'm going to read the motion and then um, there might be some questions, okay? So I do have a motion moved by um, Mayor Terziano, seconded by Councillor Armour. Be it resolved that the Director of Development Services approved site plan application SPA 53-2020-HT and that the agreement be prepared to the satisfaction of the town and further that the mayor and clerk are hereby authorized to sign any necessary documentation conditional on all final plans and drawings being to the satisfaction of the town and all other commenting agencies. So with that, I would ask if there are any questions, uh, Richard or Teresa. Wow, okay, Teresa, I'm not seeing any. So I will call the question, all those in favor. And that carries unanimously. Um, I'm really happy about this. Good luck, Teresa, thanks. Thank you, everyone. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, we're moving right along. Back to Richard. Report uh, number development 2022-23, SPA 140-2021, HT, RN Properties, on 14 Howland Drive. Yes, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. So through you, Madam Chair, the subject property is located at 14 Howland Drive at the intersection of Howland Drive and Kinton Avenue. The lands have an approximate area of 9,475 meters squared with 95 meters of frontage on Howland Drive. The lands are zoned Muskoka Commerce Park and are designated employment lands in the official plan. The lands are also within the Huntsville Urban Settlement Area. The site plan application is for the construction of a 2,804 square meter industrial building with outdoor storage enclosures. The building will house two uh, rental spaces with floor areas of 662 square meters and 677 square meters, a 780 square meter showroom and office, and a 685 square meter warehouse. According to the official plan, Huntsville's urban settlement area is intended to be the focus of year-round population and employment growth and development. Employment lands within the, this area permit a wide range of employment uses and permitted in commercial uses in these areas include those that are space extensive, highway commercial uses, or commercial uses with outdoor storage or extensive outdoor display areas. Um, design criteria for development on employment lands encourage accessibility to passing motorists and visual compatibility between surrounding uses. Landscaping, namely buffering, particularly where properties about residential, institutional, or open spaces or along provincial highways is also encouraged. In this case, the development uh, includes buildings sited well back from the street and there's a slight stagger in the front facade along Howland Drive, as well as plantings to break up the massing of the building. The trees and other plantings also provide visual screening for the development and the outdoor storage enclosures will, be, will include privacy um, slats to screen that area from view. From a compatibility perspective, the development appears highly compatible with the surrounding um, existing development and um, existing vegetation is proposed to be retained along the prop common property lines to the lands uh, to both the north and east. Site plans submitted in support of this development may require minor revisions to address concerns respecting the proposed stormwater management facilities um, pending finalization of the review of those matters by the town's operations department. Um, 
district comments, which are contained in attachment five to the report, indicated no major concerns, but did provide some comments on water and sewer services. And the plan would need to be revised as appropriate to address those concerns. Comments have been received from the building department relating to accessibility requirements for front entryway doors, and those have been provided to the applicant. No other objections have been received. Some elevations um, of the both Howland Drive uh, elevation as well as the Canton Avenue elevation. And then on the bottom, you see a section drawing. Some photos to show the site as it exists today from Kinton Avenue. Across the street. Across the street on Howland Drive and a shot of the property from across the street on Howland. The application appears to conform to the official plan and be consistent with the provincial policy statement and staff are recommending approval at this time. Subject to conditions to address outstanding matters noted in the report and any requested revisions by the relevant review agencies. And I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for, for that, Richard. Um, I will ask, I don't know if the, the um, applicant or representative for the applicant is here or would like to speak to. Ms. Bile. Chair Alcock, I do see one hand raised. Okay. I remind you to please have your microphone and video if possible turned on before you begin speaking and to confirm your name and mailing address. Hi, John. Good morning. Chair Alcock, members of committee, uh, John P. Gallagher, 24 Hibbard Road, Huntsville, P1H1C9. Also uh, watching online is the owner of the property, Randy Nickerson. I think uh, Richard has explained the application quite well. This is uh, a local business that is in midst of an expansion and upgrading from their existing facility out in the West End of Huntsville to a new facility in the Commerce Park. Uh, the Nickersons uh, have been heavily invested in the community for many years and has, have seen their business uh, grow. We first met with uh, staff almost uh, about a year ago and coming up with uh, a plan for this site. Uh, and again, we had a number of items that were requested of us uh, specifically with the entrance locations and uh, the design works. The building itself will end up uh, being a uh, landmark building. We did want to uh, put more into it because of its uh, corner location and having the double frontage. From the building uh, elevations, you can see Randy's business uh, taking up a substantial uh, portion of this, including the warehousing uh, section at the rear. We've tried to keep all the warehouse and storage and loading zones tucked to the uh, northeast side where it abuts the uh, bus depot, I believe Campbell bus lines uh, shop and uh, storage yard are to the east. To the north of the site uh, was the recent uh, approved uh, development uh, that includes the loft, uh, I believe warehouse uh, retail store. And I think with the plan that we've come up with, we've tried to provide uh, some landscaping that over time will uh, grow and provide uh, substantial buffering along the uh, both roads. We've also done some entrance uh, specific landscaping, as well as breaking up some of the monotony along the uh, building, both with the use of landscaping and staggered setbacks. Uh, we've provided accessible spots uh, in close relation to the front doors. Um, we would uh, ask committee to respectfully approve uh, the site plan. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any and uh, leave Randy's uh, also around should I not be able to answer. Thank okay. you. 
Much appreciated, John. If you put your mute on, I am going to read the motion at this point. Has been moved by Councillor Armour, seconded by Councillor Weeb. Be it resolved that the Director of Development Services approve site plan application SPA 140 2021 HT and that the agreement be prepared to the satisfaction of the town. And further, that the mayor and clerk are hereby authorized to sign any necessary documentation conditional on all final plans and drawings being to the satisfaction of the town and all other commenting agencies. Okay, so um, now that I've read it, I notice Mayor Terziano, you were quick with your hand up, over to you. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just, uh, I don't know if this question is for Richard or, or John maybe, but I noticed the district is indicating only a single water and sewer service. Is that en enough to, to meet the needs of this building or is, does that have something to do with capacity issues? Okay, I noticed Richard's nodding, but John has his hand up. Both of you are keen to answer. Who'd like to go first? I was John. actually gonna, Let's throw it over to John. Okay, John, over to you. Okay, so anytime uh, with these types of property, the district has a rule that there's only one service per site. So basically, uh, Randy will have to separately meter the building from within for each of the tenants that are there. So we think uh, that can be addressed quite easily. Okay. So just further to that, John, it, it, it's not a capacity issue for for the allotment that's there. It's just well, it was, the, the district's it, way. Yeah, it's one one service per lot. If he had uh, done a condominium plan for each of the units, then in theory, they could probably get an individual service line on each one. Uh, so it'll be one service coming into the building. Randy will then separate it and separately meter each of uh, the tenants. Right, okay, sounds good. Okay, are there any other questions? Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you for coming today, John. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. All right. Um, with that, I am going to go back to Richard on for 7.4, um, and it's an FYI. And Richard's prepared a quite a thorough uh, report on our planning application overview. So over to you, Richard. Thank you. And I do also, um, through you, Madam Chair, have a, a brief presentation, a couple slides on it too. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Great. I always find these reports really interesting. It kind of confirms for you that, oh, we actually have been pretty busy. <laughs> you see the numbers. Well, I don't think I need any confirmation of that, but if it helps <laughs> others. <laughs> um, so the report provides a description of applications received by the planning department in 2021. It also describes applications considered over the course of the year um, by various committees and staff. It provides updates regarding Ontario Land Tribunal appeals and hearings, and it discusses other activities of note and what the department is looking forward to in 2022. The table here is taken from attachment um, or from that report, uh, attachment one, and shows intake by application type in 2021, and then compares it to the last three years. So as you can see, the um, total applications in 2021 on the right-hand side was 297. Um, which is slightly below the three-year average, but higher than the past two years. And um, on, on the three-year average, I should say that uh, two, 2018 was a very, appeared to be a very busy year. Um, so here's a graph also taken from the report from attachment one that just shows the, again, the application types um, by year. Um, this illustrates that there was an upward trend overall in overall applications driven by site plans and minor variance applications. It also shows that consents and zoning bylaw amendments are lower than average, but have rebounded after a dip in 2020. 
as noted in the report, um, new official plan policies, which restrict rural development, encourage intensification in the urban settlement area, and provide more protection for natural constraints, may explain some of the lower application intake numbers, particularly for consents and zoning bylaw amendments. The fact that the plan itself is also um, new is also a factor. For instance, there are restrictions in place to um, restrict official plan amendment applications within two years of a new official plan being passed. Restrictions in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 was likely also, also likely had an influence. Planning applications considered um, are also described in the report and I won't, um, I won't review these slides, but that information is in there. Um, committee of adjustment, um, there were 53 minor variances and three consents. And from a staff delegated approval perspective, there were 126 waterfront residential site plans, 37 consents, three holding liftings, three uh, road closures, and I, I believe it's one deeming bylaw. So some of the other notes um, that were interesting in the report, there was a total of 447 new, um, new units or new lots created that are capable of housing a new unit. Um, and of those 447, 6% were low density, 47% were, me were medium density, and 47% were high density. Uh, there were 298 municipal record search requests, and those are searches done when someone is closing on a real estate transaction and um, having their lawyers look into things like zoning compliance and building permit histories. There were 110 pre-consultation request forms received. So those are um, every time an application or an applicant is um, thinking of making an application, we have a pre-consultation process they can go through. The, the actual number of formal pre-consultation meetings um, is 76, um, but we also handle a lot of pre-consultations just over the phone with our applicants also. Um, a huge number, uh, 3,500 general inquiries fielded by staff in 2021. Um, there were two Ontario Land Tribunal appeals received. One was the um, an appeal of a multi-residential development on Campus Trail, and one was an appeal of a minor variance application. There were two Ontario Land Tribunals that staff participated in over the course of the year. And I think the total time commitment was six weeks. Um, there was also significant um, work to advance the community planning permit bylaw. Um, and just an update on that, we uh, throughout the year worked on public engagement on the bylaw itself. We developed a bylaw in first draft and had public consultation in the form of an open house and a public meeting on that. And we worked on revising that bylaw uh, to address those concerns and we're currently just I'll do the update now um, we're working on the second draft with our consultants um, that we've seen the second draft we've given their uh, them our comments and they're working to finalize it so that we can release it for another round of uh, public consultations hopefully in early April um, this was interesting. I just thought I'd show, um, and if you haven't heard, the, the 2021 census information is out. So some of this information is from that. Um, I looked back and pulled the dwellings for Huntsville from 2001 to 2021. And with that 447 units that we looked at in 2021, I just calculated 
projected forward if we kept up that rate and those were actually built, what would it look like in terms of dwellings in five years time? And it's quite a big, if we kept that up, quite a big increase. It's like a 20% increase that we could experience. Um, this graph is also from the report and it's those 3,500 general inquiries that we handled. So just show, looking back over three years, um, it's like a 200% increase. Um, and just to put this in perspective, this is uh, when we don't, these are calls that come in or messages that come in to our phone line or email address that we haven't, or sorry, it's our phone line that we haven't picked up. So it's actually a lot busier than this, but when a message is left, this is a ticket is created. So 3,500 were 2021. And um, that just shows how busy we are in the planning department. And this is mostly fueled by what I would describe as a, a real estate frenzy um, that we experienced in this area, um, probably throughout cottage country in 2021. Looking forward, um, we're gonna be reviewing more planning applications. We have uh, Ontario Land Tribunal hearings for the Earls Road development and the Wilson appeal. The other appeal that I mentioned that we received for the campus trail property was actually um, uh, settled or withdrawn. Um, so no, no need for a hearing on that. Uh, there's the CP by, CPP bylaw finalization and rollout. Um, we're looking at modernization of planning applications intake review and approvals processes through using a um, cloud permit software, which is the exact same software that we're using in the building department, which we're very excited about. Um, and we are going to be reviewing application fees and staff resources to address uh, CPP bylaw implementation and the increasing development pressures and long range planning needs in Huntsville. So those are just, uh, that's an update for 2021. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I'll stop sharing, sorry. Thank you, thank you Richard. Um, it is one hell of a lot of, of work, a lot of work there. And um, a bit overwhelming actually, when you see the over 3000 inquiries, that's crazy. Um, and you may have mentioned this, but the reference to why it was so busy in 2018, I guess was, that was just before we approved the new official plan. So the thinking is people were getting applications in under the old plan. That, that you, I think you probably said that, but I missed it, right? Because well, I didn't make that connection, but that actually does make a lot of sense. Well, I, somebody must have, I must have been in there, but okay, I, I, I'm assuming that's the case, Kirsten, that sort of the thinking, right? Okay, thanks. Uh, anybody have questions of our, um, no way. Great report. Thank you for that. All right. Oh, Councillor Stone, in under the wire. Thanks. Um, I, I just want to ask the question about staffing. You know, uh, are we still understaffed? Because I know we have been all this past year. I'm going to ask uh, Kirsten if you'd like to speak to that. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Alcock. I know Richard would, what Richard would say in response. I know, to, um, I know, but I feel like, <laughs> Richard, if you'd like to respond, you may. You absolutely may. What? But I thought I would ask Kirsten to respond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That um, definitely we're going to be reviewing it in consideration of what we'll be um, implementing in the community planning permit bylaw. Because it's going to be a pretty significantly different process for us as well, we're going to have to make sure that we're not over-regulating or trying to enforce too much. So we're being very cautious as to what we're putting in place, but once the bylaw is approved, then we're going to have to review and see just how many resources we need to in order, in order to make sure it, it works effectively. But we're not trying to over-regulate by any sense of the imagination. I know there's been some discussion um, through the public consultation process that there's things that we're getting into that maybe the public isn't interested in, but we're going to be careful with it and try and make sure that the resources we have can be used efficiently and effectively. Just a follow-up, if I can. If I can. Mm -hmm. um, so um, 
the time between applications uh, or, or uh, people that want to do something coming to us, is there a long period of time before we actually get them out the door? It, Richard probably would be better positioned to answer that. I do know that there are more, with the new official plan, we are looking at more technical things than we were previously. There's more requirement for studies and those studies take longer to review. Um, the scale of development as well, these larger developments, as you saw with the site plans, when they're, they're big developments, they do take a considerable amount of work and the stormwater management gets reviewed by ops and sometimes that gets peer reviewed. And so those things do take longer than say an everyday consent or a minor variance, but Richard might have more Richard. input on. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess what I would say is it's we're still pretty quick in Huntsville, um, but the more complicated the application, uh, the more studies are involved. Um, there could be peer reviews, um, so that does make for a longer application review um, window. But um, I, I guess from a staffing perspective, if there's um, if there in the future if we're trying to meet this uh, 45 day window or we're trying to deliver um, to the full potential of the community planning permit bylaw, that's just another reason why we might wanna think about our staffing resources to make sure we're right sized. But I think we're hitting pretty good application review windows for your average application right now. Um, it's just when they get more complicated, it can take longer. Thanks for that. Good question. And certainly, if you think about your your curve that you projected out, Richard, if we're if the number of applications is going to increase, then um, that certainly is something we, you, you we want to be thinking about. Um, all right, I'm seeing some nodding heads there. I I make note of that, Director Maxwell. Some nodding heads in the favor of that. Just saying. All right. Um, Thank you, Richard, once again. And with that, I'm going to move to our last item under this, under staff reports, and that's over to you, Director Maxwell. Thank you, Chair Alcock. Um, this report has been provided for information just to give some history of development um, that's abutting non-maintained municipal or private roads. There was quite a discussion at the January meeting um, and, and it, it did go, um, all over the place about how we did it in the past, what we do now. And so I thought it might be helpful just to have a recap. Uh, traditionally development on private roads and seasonally maintained public roads was for cottages and not dwellings intended for year round use. In the nineties, and I'm not quite sure how long it lasted, but it was quite a short period of time. The town did entertain development on non-maintained or seasonally maintained municipal roads with a roads use agreement that was entered into between a property owner and the town. However, it wasn't registered under the title and future owners weren't necessarily aware of any service limitations that came with having a dwelling on those roads. The building code provides opportunity for dwellings to be sprinklered and meet the intent of fire route requirements. However, this provision has been mainly put in place in my understanding to facilitate condominium developments where they can't meet the fire route access requirements. Um, through the official plan review, there were many, many, many discussions about rural development versus urban development, affordability of both climate change impacts, resiliency of the municipality, and rural development standards. And ultimately, the official plan was approved with limitations on development in rural areas that ensured that residential development would occur on year-round maintained municipal roads or through uh, an approval on a condominium road. Recently, we've seen uh, more applications requesting development permissions that do not meet the official plan policies for rural development. In those instances where council has approved a zoning amendment or a minor variance, we have entered into an agreement which is registered on title and it details the limitations on municipal and emergency services available. The town's legal council has noted that this is an appropriate mechanism and it does mitigate liability to some extent. However, nothing would provide absolute assurance. Um, and then I would just note that if development is to be contemplated on non-maintained roads in future, 
the municipality would like to see the roads being brought up to a municipal standard so that they could be maintained year round. So that's in a nutshell, sort of the history and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, uh, much appreciated, um, Kirsten. It certainly is a good backgrounder for, for our next item. Do, does anybody have a question for Kirsten at this point? Yes, Councillor Stone. Um, I don't know if it's a question or comment, but um, as you stated, um, a lot of cottages are now being turned into year-round homes, and some of those are on unmaintained roads. Um, I think we really need to get our heads around how we can make this happen, um, whether it be demanding sprinklers or having a the legal agreement like you mentioned before and have it registered on title if that's necessary. But um, I, I really think that uh, um, demanding that they only be on year round maintained municipally standard roads um, is not uh, something that we should be doing. People are, have been living in the woods in Huntsville for hundreds of years and um, not always on a beautiful road. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. All right. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, followed by Mayor Terziano. Thank you, Chair Alcock. I, I agree with uh, Councillor Stone. I, and I don't agree all the way across the board. I think each application is is of its own merit. Um, I don't think that every application that comes across our board should be considered a notable lot. But, um, if there's room for services, private services, then then I think it's it's something that should be considered. Um, you know, there's a reason we have good responsible growth and, and more growth than some of our uh, neighboring partners in the, in the, in the province. So um, I guess the thing that, that there's, there's no land available. Um, Mayor Terziano alluded to we're, we're out of land in town and, uh, you know, next we're going to go up and, and it's, it's probably a reality, uh, how soon and how high, who knows. But I think if the opportunity presents itself that there are lots that can be developed responsibly and registered on title that it's a non-maintained municipal road, um, I, I think that's something we need to consider on, on an individual basis and uh, provide those people an opportunity to come to Huntsville and live where it's reasonable, affordable, and it, uh, it, it meets our criteria of responsible development, so. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mayor Terziano, followed by Councillor Weep. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I don't disagree with um, what's been said. However, I disagree with the um, process of dealing with these on an individual basis. We have an official plan that right now says no to um, developing on non year round maintained roads. And if we wanna change that, I think the process is to change it through the official plan. Um, as far as um, the cottages and stuff, I, I do realize more people are turning cottages into year round homes. The non um, maintained year round road doesn't apply if you're on water. So most cottages are on water. Um, I'm sure there are areas in the rural um, that are on non-maintained, but we've got lots of rural land on maintained roads as well. So it's not as if, as if it's the only development opportunity for people out there. We have lots of rural land on fully maintained roads. But I, I think for me, the crux of this is we have a lot of um, seasonally maintained or unmaintained roads that we're experiencing problems with, with individuals on them now. And that's only gonna to continue to grow and the cost of that's going to continue to grow. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of, of dealing with these one-offs, um, especially without hardcore legal ability to never have them come back on us. And I think um, committee will be made even more aware at the end of the month when we have another deputation about another couple of um, non-maintained roads. So. 
Thank you, uh, Councillor Weep. Uh, thank you, Chair Alcock. Um, Kirsten, I'm wondering if um, you could uh, touch on that or, or again, give a little bit more context to the legal aspect of it. Uh, that was certainly uh, a concern that I'd raised last time and believe that uh, it's due to the legal legal elements of what's on title, what isn't on title, that has seemed to get us caught up in some of these past developments that are on unmaintained roads, et cetera. So if you could um, just give us a little bit more depth to your interpretation of our legal counsel and um, how you feel uh, going forward, how, um, how bulletproof, I guess you could say, uh, or not, um, these, these types of, of agreements would be and how that would, uh, how it would be registered, that whole process, if you could, thanks. Kristen? Absolutely, through you, um, Chair Alcock. So um, our legal counsel reviewed uh, an agreement to ensure that for new development only, not historic development, because I, I don't have many details on that side of it, but for new development, if we have an agreement registered on title through the Planning Act, which allows us to register it on title. New owners would then be advised or have the ability to be aware of limitations on services from that perspective. And they have advised that that is really all we can do if we're approving development of that nature, that this is the only way we can try and, and avoid and cover off and mitigate any liability. However, they have noted that there's no way that we could ever be 100% assured and as we know from the many claims that are filed against the town, the town is considered to be uh, involved in everything because we have insurance and deep pockets and we're a municipality and future owners will always come back and try and um, if there's an issue, they'll always try and, and sue the town because that's what insurance companies do. They will go after the town regardless. Whether or not um, our legal counsel has said that the fact that we would have an agreement is a bonus because then it's actually saying we were proactive and we did recognize that there could be issues in the future, but there's nothing that would stop anybody in the future from trying to request a road be maintained, or if there was an issue and they couldn't have emergency services involving us in a lawsuit, considering they, that can always happen regardless. Unfortunately, um, I don't really have any information as to what the chances are or what our legal counsel would consider the chances would be that we would have to, yeah would be considered liable, so. Can I follow up, Councilor Lee? Sure, if I could follow up. So I I am I to infer that uh, mm -hmm. if we were to say, uh, approve a development on a unmaintained road, um, your level of comfort, given that um, we, we have a, a, a really sort of strict and clear uh, legal agreement on title, which means it's on the property in perpetuity. Uh, therefore, a, a new owner, if it's sold, couldn't then, uh, ignore it or, or, or happen to, to, to miss that, right? It, once it's on the title of that property, it, uh, it will always be there, if I'm understanding that correctly. And would we have to take any additional measures to ensure that, um, that it's always there? I'm not sure where my, if I've got a question or not, but um, I guess I'm, I'm, that's what I'm driving at. That, that was my number one concern through uh, this, all these processes that we've had over the years is where are we in terms of uh, our comfort level and how, how how covered really are we, right? Um, I guess I'll turn it back over. In some respects, um, it was sort of similar to a question I was going to have around that. So most of the issues that we've had to date are with owners who have been there for a long time and there were certain expectations and those expectations have changed over time or someone bought in thinking that this is what they were getting and it's not clear about what what is on title to your point right councillor weed that it, it how do we know that legal agreement that we're comfortable sort of comfortable with is there in perpetuity um good question from our perspective, once it's registered, it should be there. It shouldn't be able to be removed unless the town consents to its removal. However, um, we have seen instances in the past where things happen through the land registry office with different solicitors that things do not stay registered or they disappear or things happen. So it's, it is a mechanism that helps protect us, but I don't, I wouldn't believe it would be 100% foolproof ever. So. It could get missed. 
it could it could get missed by the the legal and or real estate transaction we, absolutely we hear quite yep. frequently that people aren't aware of consent agreements for example when we do a 5126 agreement and there's restrictions in it prior to development occurring we we hear very often that new owners aren't aware that the agreement was there right. because their solicitor didn't flag it for them when he was reviewing the property or anything. So it, it, it is a tool, but I don't think it's the most effective way to deal with things necessarily. So, although it's the only tool we have, so. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Are, are, are any other questions before we move on? Okay, seeing none, then we will move to the next the final section of our agenda, which is our previous business. And under 8.1, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey, um, who has brought report number development 2022-7Z34-2021, Bird and Barrett, regarding the 234 Longs Lake Road application. Back to committee for our consideration. Over to you, Kelsey. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, the subject property, as you noted, is located at 234 Longs Lake Road. Um, this item is back before you as the application was deferred to the last planning committee until such time that the matter was reviewed further by legal counsel and the operations department. Based on this direction, the planning department did consult uh, further with operations and legal counsel. The comments originally provided by operations still stand. Um, Director Maxwell's presentation also further illustrates the rationale for staff's recommendation and context for development on uh, non-maintained, uh, seasonally maintained roads. Uh, speaking to legal counsel, they advise that a site plan agreement can be used. However, there is never 100% assurance that the town will be protected from all liability. Additionally, there is nothing that can be put in place to prevent future requests for road maintenance or servicing. In light of this information, the staff are recommending, are still recommending denial for the application. Thank you, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a deputation request uh, with respect to this. So at this point, I will ask Crystal if you could bring our um, deputants in, please. Yes, I would be happy to do so now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm I'm noticing, Lenny. Is it just it's just you? Um, I believe so. I'll be doing the presentation. Um, okay. One of the owners, uh, Mr. Bertle, is uh, is on the line as well. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Alcock and Committee. Lenny Dennis, Wayne Simpson, and Associates uh, represent the owner who is here today, online. Um, as noted, it was uh, this application was deferred. Uh, from the previous uh, planning committee meeting. And I'd like to um, take the opportunity to thank staff um, for uh, providing uh, the research and I think a, a very fair uh, report. Um, as I see it, <clears throat> um, it doesn't seem to be an impediment uh, to the zoning uh, bylaw amendment uh, moving forward. Um, it identifies uh, clearly um, facts and, uh, and some of the issues. Uh, I'm glad to see, I think there was some confusion at the last meeting. I'm glad to see that um, uh, that agreements, uh, site plan approval, particularly in this case, uh, can be registered on title. And uh, in in my uh, experience, that once you register something, it should be there in, in perpetuity. Um, and it's registered against and runs with the title uh, of the property. Um, as such, uh, clauses could be inserted uh, that would absolve the municipality of any responsibility and liability uh, with respect to limited services, uh, no year-round uh, road maintenance, and certainly uh, with respect to um, providing sprinkler systems in, in the dwelling can be included uh, in, that, in that agreement. Uh, there was a, a note in the, uh, in the report that said that based on the agreements, um, it seemed as though if there was litigation that uh, there was a strong 
I shouldn't say strong, that you might be successful uh, in defending um, the suit. Uh, I think also in terms of uh, the zoning bylaw, you know, if, uh, if there was an issue with respect to an agreement, uh, certainly wording could be added to a zoning bylaw. Uh, clearly, people come in, uh, they look at uh, the zoning of the property and they see an exception on there, it should clearly identify uh, the fact that, you know, this property is subject to site plan approval, limited services, and so on and so forth. Um, and yes, for sure, I wanted to add that uh, um, an owner uh, could make a request uh, to either amend the agreement or remove the agreement. But at the same time, <clears throat> there has to be a willing participant. And, and in this case, it's, uh, it would be the, the town. And those types of requests um, are similar to even going through a zoning bylaw amendment. You know, you have a zoning bylaw, um, you make a request to, to change it and council can decide one way or the other. Uh, in terms of the success of that of that zoning bylaw uh, amendment, uh, with respect to uh, the sustainable development component under the unity plan, I would suggest that uh, this is an existing road. Uh, it's an existing lot. Uh, there seems to be no uh, impact on the natural heritage features, uh, and it's not directly uh, right on the on the shoreline. And some comment was made with respect to. Um, climate change and the number of vehicles as a result of this uh, site. Uh, yeah, there'll probably be two cars. Uh, they're moving from Gravenhurst to Huntsville. There's a no net, no net change. Uh, and they actually, uh, one of the owners has an electric vehicle and, and one will be uh, getting an electric vehicle. So as future moves forward in terms of emissions, um, um, maybe more electric vehicles uh, will come on stream to help with uh, with climate. Uh, with respect to the maintenance slash uh, construction costs uh, in the report, um, as noted, the owners are prepared to acknowledge the existing uh, level of service. There's no additional maintenance fees uh, for seasonal or, or year round um, maintenance. Um, it is what it is. It's, it's limited now. Um, it's a seasonal maintained road by the town. Um, and that's, and they acknowledge that they, they understand that. And there was a point made about, you know, new owners versus existing uh, owners. And some of those previous road use agreements that were signed uh, by the town, they weren't registered on title and very vague in terms of the expectations that the owners was, were uh, anticipating uh, receiving from the municipality. This is, this is a new development under a new, brand new, um, lot with brand new terms and conditions, um, you know, to be included in a, uh, in a site plan agreement. I just, if I can, if I have a few minutes, I just want to take an opportunity just to go back through some of the merits of the proposal. And I approach this in terms of sort of a split designation waterfront uh, versus rural uh, in the rural based on the, on the location of the dwelling. And I know the district had comments as well. Uh, they had the split designation as well, waterfront uh, and rural, and they weren't opposed uh, to the application. The big tests uh, for waterfront and rural um, is whether or not the property physically and functionally relates to the shoreline. The location of the proposed dwelling is on a flat level area, certainly not above the, the tree line. Um, I don't think it can be seen from the shore, and certainly I don't think it can uh, see the water from where it's proposed. Uh, there are other homes that are in the that are not beside this property. The only ones that exist are along the the shoreline, and I think with the tree line and the terrain, um, I don't think that the owner of this property would be peering into the backyard uh, of the abutting property. Um, there's no exclusive use uh, to the shoreline. Um, it is a road lounge. It leads to the water, uh, but it's a town seasonally maintained road, so the public can drive down that road and go down that road lounge. Any, any time they any time they see fit. So I, I think it's I think it's more rural than I think waterfront and the SR4 zone was the de facto zone that would allow development to proceed on a private uh, uh, sorry on a town seasonally maintained uh, road. Um, it's got the same zone as other properties in in the immediate um, area. Uh, the SR4 zone is switching from RU2 to SR4. No exceptions are required. So what they propose will, will comply. Uh, in fact, the footprint of the building is about 1,600 
uh, square feet. It's got 3.5% lot coverage, which is under the 5% um, uh, lot coverage for the SR4 uh, zone. It reflects the residential flavor of the area. Uh, it complies with the existing lot of record uh, requirements. Um, it's got 428 feet of frontage, certainly can spread the density out across that, um, that much frontage, uh, reducing the visual impact. Um, and um, well, I just wanted to add that there's no, um, no precedence um, in uh, planning, as noted already. It's, it's on a site-by-site -site, uh, basis in terms of the site-specific uh, circumstances. So when you're looking at when you look at the property um, from an owner's perspective, it's difficult to see um, why it cannot have a dwelling if there's road access, uh, there's a building location, there's a septic location. Uh, it's in an area where there's other uh, dwellings. Uh, it's the same as what they propose. And and, uh, and as I noted, particularly since they're prepared to um, acknowledge and agree to put a sprinkler system in, absolve the municipality of any liability and, and responsibility and for any uh, year-round municipal uh, road maintenance. So that would conclude what I have to say and would respect for your request, um, committee move forward with approval of the application. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Manny. And um, at this point, I am going to reread the motion that we considered at the last meeting. It has been moved by uh, and Councillor Stone, uh, we've got you moving um, this, moved by Councillor Stone, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. It is recommending that Planning Committee recommend to Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z34 2021 HD be denied. Um, the purpose and effect of which is to change the zoning from a rural two zone to a shoreline residential four zone to permit construction of a single detached dwelling on an undersized waterfront back lot. Uh, Councillor Stone. So um, I don't know if it matters if, if I'm the mover or not. Uh, I'll, I'm, what happens if we defeat this? So the, the recommendation is to deny. We say, no, we don't want to deny it. Then what happens? And I, I'm going to let um, Director Maxwell respond. I think that um, if we're denying it, then I, I don't know if it automatically means we approve. So it's a great question. So there you go. <laughs> Director you, Maxwell. Here you, I believe, and um, we'll have to have Julie help us, but I believe that if the recommendation is not one that count committee is willing to consider, then they would have to make a motion to amend it. Unless it's just... Unless it's just, um, yes. If, if there's no willingness to amend the motion, then it would pass or it would be defeated. If it's defeated, there's no bylaw that's being put forward or anything. So it's, it's yeah, a bit awkward and I don't think... It's awkward. Yeah, it would work. So, all right, Councillor Weeb. Maybe Councillor. Uh, thank Weeb you, Chair Alcock. No, I was going to say while uh, everyone's thinking about the process, I'm just going to ask: uh, Can you remind us, uh, Kelsey, what what else is on that road in terms of uh, other properties or uh, the nature of the other properties that lead to that uh, this particular spot? I'd love to be able to see the bigger map at some point uh, and just walk us through again what exactly we're looking at. That would be great. Could you put that up, Kelsey? That'd be great. Yeah, for sure. I was anticipating that, so I'll bring it up. So I'll just share my screen. The, the Councillor Fitzgerald, are you? Would you like to ask your question while we're waiting for the map? Is that what? Sure. You're... Yeah, I'm. St I'm still a little confused by the process here. <laughs> um, oh. Okay. Um, can Can we go? Come, Kelsey, yep, we, can we come back to that after Kelsey uh, walks? Absolutely. I just wanted to make that clarification. Yep. So yep. before we move yep. on too quickly, that's all. Okay. So here's the map. If you would like to, there's um, SR4 properties along the waterfront. And then 
the back lots, um, which we would consider back lots under our official plan, are, are zoned um, RU2. Maybe a bit more description as to, you know, what, what exists. That would be good. Okay. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, so essentially there's cottages or what I imagine is cottages along this road. Um, but in terms of the zoning, I can't, I don't, I can't indicate whether what they're being used for seasonal or full time, but if they're in the SR4 zone, um, they don't have the same restriction as the RU2 zone where it doesn't allow for development um, on a seasonally maintained road if it's RU2. Okay. I don't and know if that was helpful. It, it, well, well, I'll let Councillor Weeb. you might have follow up questions. Sure, if I may. Okay, so if you could with your cursor just outline where the full year round maintained road actually splits off from Longs Lake. And if you could highlight once again, where the subject property would be. So those two things. For sure. Thank you for the question. So I'll just start off with the subject property, which is here around my cursor. Yep. And we contacted operations to illustrate where the maintained year round maintained ends. And that's at 103. Um, just have a word to click on it just in case there's any information that shouldn't be shared but um can't read the numbers yeah so it does end at 103 i'll just quickly unshare my screen for a second just so i can figure out which property that is so it ends quite a way back. Is that what we're seeing? So I've just determined which one it is. Okay. So the rear, rear yard, sorry, uh, the rear year, rear year round maintain ends right here. And then the rest is seasonally maintained to this part. And then it turns into Charlie's Lane, which is private. Ma Madam Chair, can I just, while we have this up, just ask Kelsey to, so other than lots that are on water because they don't apply they're zoned differently are there any other year-round homes on the seasonally maintained piece of Longs Lake Road right now that's what I was wanting to Thank anywhere along uh, anywhere along that road um just looking right now you can see there's a driveway here um but it's my understanding that, that would be on the year round maintained portion. And then if you look further to the extent that would be seasonally maintained in the RU2 portion, it doesn't appear that there are any other, um, any other development on that portion of the road. But um, Charlie's Lane at the very end, that's private mm -hmm. and that's open? No, it's only in the summertime that's open. Not open as in pu a public road, just what condition yeah. is that road in which extends off the seasonally maintained road? Is that? It's a private road um, and these are all SR4, which allow for um, year round development um, because of the zoning itself. But so in order to access <laughs> Charlie's Lane, mm -hmm the seasonally maintained road needs to be open in order to get to Charlie's Lane though, right? Is that, I am I? Kirsten had a hand up. <laughs> yeah, Kirsten, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Kirsten. No, thank you, Chair Alcott. I was just going to say that we don't have a way to determine if any of the dwellings that have been constructed for seasonal use are being used on a year round basis or if the road is being maintained by any of the owners on Charlie's Lane for access intermittently or full-time. So there's, there's no um, way that we can determine that because we just don't know if any of the houses are being occupied year round. I would say that um, over the last year, we've seen many more cottages being used for longer times because of all of the, the COVID restrictions that have been in place, but they we don't know currently if any Charlie's Lane cottages are being used on a year round basis. But how would they access them? They would have to have a private contractor plow to get all, in. All the way down. It, yeah. 
and whether or not they have a, a roads use agreement to share costs or if not, that's, I, I'm not aware of that as Charlie's Lane is all a right of way. So each property that it crosses is the, is owned right. by the property that it's going to cross. A bit like Evergreen Trail, where yes. there's, a, there's sort of a informal road agreement amongst the private owners that use it. Something like that. Okay, um, Councilor Fitzgerald. Oh, thank you, Chair Alcock. Is, is there no one here who's been out there to, oh, to do the property or, or know whether it's maintained in the winter? Because I'm sure that all those properties that there's, Sorry. and I know there was discussion of, of shared road costs in our previous meeting um, when we were looking at this application. So anyone? <laughs> Kelsey? Thank you for the question through you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I have been out to the property. I took my car out there and I was able to travel down the road. Um, so I imagine that there's some uh, private agreement between the landowners to plow the road. Um, but I would just still reiterate that it doesn't meet the intent of our official plan, even if it's being maintained, because um, it is still a seasonally maintained road. Um, and also I should reiterate that um, in the back lot section of the official plan, there's also the size requirement of 0.8 hectares um, that it also, this lot also does not meet, so. Okay, appreciate it. I, I noticed um, our deputy clerk is, um, has not only her hand up, but she's, I can see her. So that means that I think she'd like to say something. I, my apologies for interrupting. I oh, did, that's fine. That's <laughs> I saw that the applicant had their hand up. I see they've taken it down again, but I'm just okay. wondering if they maybe wanted to speak to um, the road in particular. So I don't know if you'd like to invite them in. If they if they no longer do, they still have their hand up. Maybe the maybe the answer was. I will. I'll ask the applicant if they'd like to come in. There, there. Their hands back up. Okay. All right. And and while we're waiting for them, I noticed Councillor Fitzgerald. You, you. I'm not Thank ignoring you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, the, the question was not related to the application or, or planning at all. It's whether or not the road was open and maintained currently. And yeah. uh, that's it. Thank okay. You. So if the applicant, uh, maybe they're here, but I, we're not asking them if they've been down the road. Okay. I think they're here now, though. Hello? Oh, you're on mute, sir? Unmute there. Hello. There we go. Hello. My name is Keith Bird. I live at 515 Sarah Street North in Gravenhurst, Ontario. And uh, yes, there are uh, four year round residents that share uh, service of the road. And it actually goes quite far around. It's not just along Charlie's Lane along the west side of the lake, but it wraps around the north side and down the east side of the lake, where there's some very large cottages down there. Uh, in the million range. And so th they, they plow the road all year round. There are four people that share the cost of it for the winter. Okay. Out of curiosity, have they, if, if, they, have they, um, if they've seen the application, have they suggested that you might contribute to the cost of plowing the road? Or is that? Oh, that was uh, for sure. That was, that was, yeah, happy to, uh, happy to uh, get in on that participation. No question about it. We discussed that with some of the others uh, uh, when we first bought the lot, I, that, that was one of the things I inquired about right away. I said, what, what does this road look like in the winter? I was, we were a dilettantes in terms of bylaws. We didn't know that we weren't allowed to build there, but you know, we were concerned about the road and we found out from residents, oh yeah, we plow it and it's great. It's no problem. And I've, I've had my car in and I have, although it's electric, it has very low ground clearance and, uh, but I've been in many times. Okay, appreciate it. Um, and you said, so no one mentioned to you that there was, this site was not you weren't able to develop on it. No one. No, we, we, no. The only thing the listing said, you know, that the buyer is responsible for obtaining their own permits. And we found that to be obvious. That's of course we have to get our own permits. We didn't. And we saw RU2 and we looked at the zoning of RU2 and it said it's eligible for a seasonal dwelling, but we didn't see the fine print further down about the seasonal road. So we just said, Oh, it's RU2. Yeah, we can put a seasonal road on, uh, I mean, uh, we can put a, 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 a dwelling uh, on, on an RU2 zone. So we, we did not know. 
All right, um, Mayor Terziano, thank you for that, by the way. My pleasure. Thank you for hearing this. Yeah, I was just going to mention back when we were talking about the road, it's not really the business of this committee who's plowing a road or when they are. It's a no, seasonally I, maintained road I, as far as the town goes. I get, I and, get. Yeah, and the, the criteria for building on a seasonally maintained road, it, our official plan, it says it doesn't meet it. it, it there's two things. It's an undersized lot and it's on a non-year-round maintained road. And the recommendation is to not deny it because it doesn't meet our official plan. I, I just think we should stick to the what we're actually dealing with as opposed to, um, you know, who's going to plow the road. Uh, I think my final uh, final comment to you, Councillor Fitzgerald, unless the others. Thank you, Chair Alcock. I, I guess um, I really feel strongly this committee exists to make exceptions where we feel they're they're reasonable and responsible in uh, same you know the committee of adjustment. So um, I I think that. Um, I don't agree with the recommendation and I would like to uh, make a motion for approval. Oh, okay, then I, if you want um, a motion to amend this, I, Julie, you, you had your hand up at one point. So, okay, Julie, okay, okay. So I think, all right, will you clarify that? Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me. I just, because we're in the same room, I have to use the mic system. So hopefully it's not too much feedback. Um, I was just looking into, there was the question in regards to what would happen if the motion on the table was denied. It essentially wouldn't give any sort of resolution to it because um, you would have to either um, bring it back. So you would have to uh, substitute amend the motion, but you'd have to reconsider it before bringing it back. So it's probably not the best approach if, if you were looking to go in a different direction. So um, I will wait and hear how the amendment proceeds. Okay, um, but my what I'm hearing from Councillor Fitzgerald is you would like to present an amendment that would uh, change the word denied to approve. Is that what you're proposing? That's correct, Chair Alcock, thank you. Do you have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Stone will second that. Uh, Councillor Stone, you wanna comment? I, I do. Um, so uh, I'm happy to second this, but if we're going to do that, I would uh, like to hear from Director Maxwell about uh, an agreement, the 5150 or whatever it might be that, that says that, you know, the it, it's registered on title that it is non-maintained year round and it's uh, we, we can't guarantee emergency services will come out. Director Maxwell. Thank you, Chair Alcock. Um, we do, we did prepare um, a motion in case committee felt that they did want to approve this application. So we do have wording to that effect. If Julie, um, is Julie able to share her screen? I'm not sure about that. I, she is nodding yes. Okay, there we go. So we'll look at that right now. Okay, um, do, you, do you want me to read this? Okay, so I, it's the same motion as I previously read. And the subst substitution is as noted on screen where the denied has re been replaced with approved. Other than that, oh, and sorry, I'm going to read the whole thing because it has new wording. My apologies. It is recommended that planning committee recommend to council that zoning bylaw amendment Z34 2021 HT be approved the purpose and effect of which is to change the zoning from a rural two zone to a shoreline residential four with exception zone to permit a single detached dwelling on the lot and impose site plan control to require a site plan agreement be entered into between the town 
and owner to acknowledge access will be on a non year round maintained road and that no municipal services will be available and further that the dwelling must be fully sprinklered. Is that, is that it? Okay. So um, is that what uh, the movers and the seconders, or is that the wording you were looking for? Yes. Okay. Councillor Weeb, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Chair Lecoq. Um, Kirsten, can you tell me then what onus is on the, the applicant to do this through legal channels, or is it does that fall on us? I mean, do we incur legal costs, or is this something that the applicant has to um, see through? Yeah, what would happen is um, the town would draft the site plan agreement. It would be signed by the owners, the mayor and clerk, and it would be provided back to the owner to register on title. And their building per permit wouldn't be available until such time as they provided us with the proof that the agreement was registered. Okay, so are there any other questions? Mayor Terziano. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Just Wondering through you to Kirsten, why is the onus on us to prepare these documents and do the mm -hmm. work? Um, it's an application that comes through. So the planning department receives a fee for the site plan agreement application as well. So it's the, the fee for the process covers the document preparation. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, Councillor Weeb? Hi, so thank you. Sorry, it's, uh, no, sorry for good. dragging this out. But uh, one of the one of the items that is still in the back of my mind as well is uh, the fact that the overall size of mm. the lot doesn't meet our OP, and therefore I'm wondering if it might not be complement or contemplated to then perhaps restrict the size of the of the potential dwelling as well. I don't know if that's something that uh, should be commensurate, if that's the right word. If you, if you know what I'm driving at, if the lot's too small, should we ensure that um, it can't be overbuilt in a way? Well, I'm just wondering how that would look. To your point, we recently denied another application for an undersized lot. And we haven't spent any time on this with respect to, I can't remember how undersized it is. Perhaps I can see your hand, Councillor Fitzgerald. Kelsey, can you remind committee how undersized it is? Thank you for the question, Chair Alcock. I'll just make sure I have the right um, size listed to, to read out to you. Um, so it is 4,200 square meters. And the requirement for the official plan is 0.8 hectares. So you've just compared meters to hectares. Maybe that would be helpful for us to know how shy that is. Maybe it's just me, but I'm not too swift in that these days. <laughs> yeah. Could, would you mind doing that conversion for us? It's 8,000. I just wanted to check. So, so 8,000. Yeah. And it's it was 40, what was it? 4,600? 4,200. Okay, so half. Yeah. Oh, okay, Kim. So, oh, sorry. Sure. Sorry, uh, just on Councillor Weed's question, we do also have block coverage um, provisions within our zoning bylaw, which. Right, if I can follow up on that. So right now, as if I heard Lanny correctly, they're at 3.5% of the overall five that's acceptable. It sounds to me that 2.5% lot coverage should be applied in this case, given that the lot uh, yes. is halfway to the, to the necessary um, size to meet our OP. It's a compromise that I, mm -hmm. I think might be worth considering. And Kelsey, is that something we could we could have as a condition? Yes, that would be at your discretion. That's correct. Interesting. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair Alcock. I, I have decided not to make my comment. Thanks. Okay. So, um, Back to you, Councillor We is that, is, that would be, I think I'm yeah. going to ask Kirsten and or Kelsey, do you, if, if that was something that Councillor Weeb, I'm not saying you are considering it, but if you were considering, you know, the, the envelope 
as a condition, would you need us to add that to this proposed amendment? I'd be prepared to forward put that towards this amendment. It, uh, in my eyes, it's, it, 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 like I said, it would be commensurate with the, uh, what we're approving. Right. Okay, um, Councillor Fitzgerald. I, I would second that. It seems reasonable to move this forward. Okay, I, Julie, how, how have you, do you, do you need a minute to get the right wording? Yes. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you mind, everybody, we're going to take a five minute break here uh, because it's almost been two hours. I didn't realize that. So it's 2.55. We, we, would three o'clock work? Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Three o'clock. Five minute break.
Um, Kelsey, you have your hand up. Sorry, I'm not sure that was an accident. <laughs> okay, 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 all right. We're about to put the uh, proposed amendment to the amendment up on screen. So um, I'm not going to reread the entire thing. The only change to what I had read before um, is in addition to changing denied to approve, we've added the line, the maximum uh, primary lot coverage shall be 2.5%. And then the rest is the same and impose site plan and control and to acknowledge access, et cetera, et cetera. Councillor Weeb, is, does that suit your purpose? It does. Okay. Um, everybody saw the, the proposed amendment to addition to the amendment. Um, are there any questions with respect to that? If not, I will call the question. Um, do you want it back on the screen for one more look or can I call the question? All those in favor of the amendment. Okay, and that carries. So um, now I don't need to, I need to one more time, just ask committee to consider um, the main motion as amended. And if every, everybody can now remember, that's what we've got. I will call the question, all those in favor. And that carries. All right, all those opposed. And that is recorded. So there we go. Um, that's that, right? Julie, I don't need to, we've done it. All right. Thank you for the long and um, long process on that one. And um, interesting discussion. So I just need to go like that and you have the amended. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, we don't have any other, anything under new business unless, uh, Kirsten, do you have anything? Nope. Um, and under general information, I believe Richard, you did your community planning permit update previously. So we don't have anything there. Are there any questions with respect to staff delegated approvals? Seeing none, then I do have a final motion. It has been moved by Councillor Weeb, seconded by Councillor Stone. It is recommended that we do hereby adjourn at uh, 3.05 p.m. All those in favor. And that carries. Unanimous.